we're going to look at the Dirac comb function. So that can be expressed as follows. It's essentially the sum from minus infinity to plus infinity of the Dirac impulse shifted by a specific amount. And that amount is related to the sample frequency. So we have T of S is 1 divided by F of S. So we can look at that function in time. And essentially what we see is this comb of impulses separated by n t sub s and the direct impulse itself will be centered at time equals zero and then we have one two three etc so in why is that useful why is this function useful well if we take a continuous time function let's say x of t and if this were um, like so if we said okay y of t equals x of t multiplied by this s of t function our direct comb function then essentially we have the ability to sample at specific points dictated by our sample rate, the continuous time signal. Now, wouldn't it be great if we could analyze and see what the frequency components of the resultant yt were? And we can if we take the Fourier transform of this expression. But if we just say, well, what is the bandwidth or what is the what are the frequency components of x of t? We'll express that as a x of omega. We're going to see pi or omega just because it's in, in terms of omega but typically this might be normalized to either 2 pi if you go from 0 to 2 pi or pi and minus pi you see that in some text so we're just going to call this our continuous frequency domain omega so we could say that this expression if we want to put it in terms of this omega is x omega and if we multiply in the time domain then we convolve in the frequency domain so we have this ex this expression here and during this Fourier transform we also have to scale the resultant so typically scale across a normalized frequency range uh, 1 over 2 pi and so we end up with a complete expression like so what we need to find in the first instance is essentially what this expression is and we can do that by taking the the Fourier transform of, of s of t because that takes us from the time into the frequency domain and we'll find that the Fourier transform of um, s of t so we could write that so d is equal to um, the sampled frequency range. So let's call that omega s, where omega s is equal to this omega divided by the time the time steps within the analog domain, if you like, or the continuous time domain. So this is our essentially our scale, and we can say that this is the sum minus infinity. Oops, minus infinity. Dirac. Now we can express this in terms of our sampled frequency domain. So what this tells us or begins to tell us is that the sampled uh, frequency range or the sample frequency components are going to be shifted by integer steps of uh, the sample frequency. If we write all this out, this full expression now down here, we end up with 1 over 2 pi. convolved with the this expression here uh, this this omega s can get but because this is a constant this, this can get brought over here so actually the the the, the, the omega sense the 2 pi this is going to be essentially essentially this let's call this 2 pi then uh, this will be 2 pi over ts which means the two pi's will cancel and we'll, we'll be left with 1 over ts but what about this expression here this uh, x omega convolved with this sum of Dirac delta functions uh, omega minus n omega s well we can we, we know that if we convolve a signal with essentially a, a shifted Dirac delta function then the resultant expression is the, the same expression but shifted in its own right so what do I mean by that? Well, if you, if you, if you took um, x of t and you convolved it with a Dirac delta function that was shifted by essentially an amount here, then this would equal the x of t minus t1, so a shifted version of itself. And that's because the Dirac delta functions, they're only ever, um, they only ever integrate to 1 at these specific points. So therefore, um, the, so therefore, the value is only ever going to take on. And this is essentially the sampling element of this function. So we can rewrite this knowing that property because we're convolving. All we're doing, all we do, we can see that the um, the expression series now omega rather than t's. So we can say y omega equals 1 over t sub s. And we can say it's just going to be at the sum minus infinity to plus infinity 
of x omega minus n omega s. So we've actually got from this point here down to this point here. And what we can see from this is if we step through, if we, if we make n equal to zero, so, you know, at the, the zero point, then y omega, let me just write this out, equals, oops, y omega is going to be equal essentially to the, the x of omega. Now, um, and, and, and if, if we then we make n equal one, n equal two, n equal three, we'll see that what we we'll get is if we look at y omega, we'll find that we'll we'll see the original frequency spectrum. So we'll call, we'll just call it y, uh, sorry, omega, and we'll see a shifted version, which is centered around this omega s, and this will continue on. And this point here is often referred to as the guard band. Because we can see if we make the omega s too small, then we'll begin to get overlap in this area. And this overlap is what we call aliasing. So we can see, you know, due to Nyquist-Shannon, we need to make the omega s at least twice the amount of omega in order to ensure, because this is essentially half of the omega, then this needs to be twice the frequency of interest, i.e. Nyquist-Shannon theory.